Thanks for joining everybody. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, all the video conferencing, I think I've never met so many people from the waist up. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting time, but uh, I thank you for joining today. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. These, uh, it's a pretty short presentation, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a serial entrepreneur. My name is Dave Copps. I've spent my entire career, career really building companies that have foundation in AI and machine learning. Uh, I was actually an anthropology major in college, much to the dismay of my mother. Uh, but I've always been a curious technologist and AI is something I've been had a passion for my whole career. Um, through, my, through my companies, I've placed uh, AI and machine learning in hundreds of companies around the world. Um, and I'm currently CEO of a company called Worlds out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have a platform that enables uh, machines to see and sense the world like we do, uh, kind of magnifying human perception, if you will. Uh, and I've been uh, fortunate to have some success in the, the industry over the years. Um, my wife says I'm unemployable. I think that's probably why I start companies. <laughs> but she's probably right. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because um, when I signed up to do this talk, it was before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so the last several days, it seemed like a strange time to give a talk about abundance. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I actually realized it's, it's not um, because the, the tools and the technologies uh, that uh, were all powering the pre-COVID-19 abundance are the same ones that'll get us out of the crisis. Uh, so I think there's maybe talk like this is even more relevant now than it was several weeks ago. Um, it's hard not to watch the news and adopt the dystopian view of AI. Uh, <laughs> I think we see a lot of stories and it's always is the future about us or about technology. And I think that's kind of a false choice. It's not about us or technology. There's no reason we can't have both. Um, so we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, people empowered by AI solving problems like we've never had before. Um, so in terms of change, uh, the next 10 years will equal the last 100 years. Uh, and more importantly, the way that we work over the next 15 years will change more than it has over the last 2,000 years as we kind of co evolve with AI. It becomes a more integrated part of all of our lives and our businesses. Um, you know, the first question I get asked most of the time when I talk to people is about jobs. Um, some of you may have seen this, this headline uh, the New York Times President ranks automation versus job challenge. He cites the burden of finding work for those displaced by machines. Well, if you have seen it, you're more than 50 years old because that's actually from 1962 and it was response to something that President Kennedy said. Um, so this is not a new thing. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, we can't let fear of displacement slow us down. It's, it's time to embrace uh, AI and the emerging technologies that are with us today. So why now? Why is this happening now? Um, well, first of all, after two AI winters where the promise of the technology actually exceeded the results. We're all set for a persistent acceleration of AI. Uh, in my opinion, no more AI winters. I think uh, the foundation is set and uh, more specifically, that includes accelerated hardware. So thanks to companies like NVIDIA and Intel and ARM, we're able to process information a thousand times faster than previous processors. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, you know, with uh, data, uh, <laughs> it used to be that we had too much data, and if you had too much data, it was a liability. But today, uh, because of the learning opportunities with AI and the ability to store it cheaply, we can't get enough of data. We can't get enough data. So, um, uh, and then probably most importantly, uh, it, I believe, is the, um, the, ex the acceleration of software. So, deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, we're experiencing a new revolution in the machine's ability to learn. And so I want to look at those a little bit deeply. Let's look at each of these areas just a little uh, more deeply. So um, because of the advances in hardware, something really incredible is happening. While we're not bending time, um, we're absolutely transforming what's possible in time. You know, with over 32 billion transistors on a chip today, um, we're able to now have calculations per second over 200 quadrillion. <laughs> uh, Think about that. You know, if, if every person on Earth, to kind of put it in perspective, if every person on Earth completed one calculation per second, uh, it would take 330 days to do what this Department of Energy Summit supercomputer can do in one second. Um, so hardware uh, continues to, to get better and better. We now have specialized chip companies coming out building chips specifically for AI, um, and it's uh, in Intel and in, uh, Nvidia are getting involved as well. So let's look at data. Um, so there's 25 billion connected devices in the world today. Um, there's a, there'll be a hundred billion connected, uh, by 2024. Um, today there's, by the end of this year, they're saying there'll be 3.5 billion cellular IOT connections by the end of this year. Um, 
So we're really, we're heading towards a trillion sensor economy. So we are approaching a time uh, where everything we touch will be intelligent and connected. So the opportunity for the energy industry uh, to, to remotely sense and optimize their environments has never been greater. Um, in terms of data, you know, I saw a stat the other day that more data was created this year than in the past 5,000 years. Um, but you don't hear about uh, how do we store all this data anymore? You don't hear that anymore. Uh, is this, so the more data, the better when it comes to AI. Um, I think the most amazing thing though, in this whole evolution is the software. Uh, maybe I'm biased because I'm a software guy and an AI guy, but um, you know, we start back in time, uh, in 1952, Bernie the Brain could beat a human. <laughs> they had about 255,000 move, possible moves in tic-tac-toe. Um, of course, in 1997, we all heard about uh, Kasparov and there were 121 million possible moves there. Um, then it gets really interesting, right? So now with uh, Google's AlphaGo, I'm sure most of you or some of you have heard about this, but um, there's a game called Go, uh, which is the most complex board game in the world. And it has uh, over uh, has more possible moves than there are atoms in the universe to give you an idea of the complexity. Um, so Google's AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl, the world's greatest Go player. But the real departure here, and the thing that's important for us all to realize is that um, rather than learning from data, what happened was it played itself in the game for four hours. Um, so think about that, four hours of gameplay and learning in AlphaGo exceeded 1500 years of human knowledge. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing when you think about it. Has anyone seen the, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the, the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick several years ago. Anybody seen that? Um, remember in the end of the game where, um, the Whopper was the computer, I think, W-O-P-R. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the game, it played itself in the game of thermonuclear war and it stopped and said, the only way to win is not to play. You know, learn by simulating war. And uh, that's really what's happening here today now. We have technology that does not require data to learn, uh, a data set to learn. You can actually learn on the fly uh, from experience. So uh, very, very impressive. Um, so we really evolved from things uh, where technology has been obedient, static, and logic-based, I mean, command-based, to automated, dynamic, and intuitive. <laughs> so in a, it's, in a way, it's, AI is becoming a lot less like data and a, a lot more like curve. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, let me do a poll real quick. Uh, uh, how many of you uh, are within three feet of your cell phone right now? Raise your hand. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we, we learn from uh, Google. We, uh, we learn where to go with maps. Um, we're all pretty much, you know, a little ways. Uh, we're augmented our, by AI today. We're all augmented cyborgs. <laughs> but that's important because uh, to realize that, that that distance is going to get shorter and shorter between us and the technology and the AI because we're limited by our biology. Um, you know, um, our brains process information at about 60 bits a second, where AI processes information at a trillion bits a second. Um, to make matters worse, our recall is about 65 or 70% of what we learn. On Saturday night, it may be 50%. Uh, AI, on the other hand, uh, recalls 100%. So it's important that we continue to, uh, to um, uh, our interactions and become more intimate with AI and help to augment our abilities through AI. Um, so what's next for energy? Um, I think one of the most powerful manifestations of artificial intelligence that's happening today occurs when organizations choose to sense their worlds through the lens of AI. Um, so by combining AI and sensor networks, some um, energy companies can extract and analyze data from the real world in the way that large tech companies extract data from the virtual world. So the result is kind of a radical improvement in how we can quantify and predict and optimize the real world. Um, so dark environments, uh, remote environments that uh, we have today, the ones that are not being fully sensed, can all be lit up, connected, optimized, quantifiable, and smart. So it's uh, presenting nothing less than a new ability for a new world. Um, so the problems we're solving, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our work at Worlds. Um, so the problem we're solving, you've probably seen these, drawing boxes on screens, and people are teaching AI to learn things. and. Uh, security systems, we have cameras, multiple cameras on a screen, and then multiple screens with multiple cameras on screens, and that just really doesn't work. You know, it's a, it's a reactive system. It doesn't do anything that's state-of-the-art as you wait for something to break and go wrong and you go check it out. Um, we think there's a better way. So um, essentially what we're doing is taking a solution where we're combining three things. So uh, 
we're combining AI, uh, deep learning AI, uh, with sensor networks. So it could be cameras initially, but we're also working with uh, some very exciting sensors that we can talk about later. Um, but and then we, we take the information from those centers and we we send we optimize those and have those viewable inside, we express those inside of a 4D model, literally a model like a game, like a video game. So by combining the deep learning and IoT inside the model, we're creating uh, a very uh, environment where everything is measurable in space and time. So with the ability to measure physical objects, we can now engage AI's help in how to optimize those environments. Um, so our solutions, so we've got uh, the 4D interface. So you have a, a 4D interface where it becomes kind of a home base for IoT. All sensors can be deployed inside the environment and you can actually not just see this information from the sensor, but understand what's happening when and where. Um, We'll show you some telepresence capabilities here in a second. We can actually fly around the models like you're in a drone. Um, story event detection, where we can actually uh, start to um, uh, give you the ability to understand AI, the ability to understand when things are happening, critical events are happening that need to be addressed. Um, and then we have an accelerated learning model. Um, but uh, there's a training model, uh, a bot layer that layers on top. So we can have an AI that actually starts to un uh, look at the model and learn from it and help you do things, uh, make environments safer and more productive. Um, for your presence, I'll show you here in just a moment. And spatial navigation, I'll show you here in just a moment. Um, so nothing like to tell the story like a real demo. So I thought, let me take you inside and show you what we have here. So we call this kind of our, uh, it's kind of a God, a God view, if you will. Uh, so it's a, you can actually have all your locations, whether they're in the country, a state, or all over the world, and they can be viewed from a single interface. Uh, and from this view, you can actually kind of go down and, and view what's happening in certain areas or remote observation capabilities. So um, in this case, uh, we're flying down into Dallas. We're in the, uh, to Ross Avenue and Market Street. Some of you know Dallas pretty well. Um, so this is a model where we have, um, uh, and I'll stop it here for a second. What we've done is we've uh, actually reconstructed the, the, the intersection of the buildings and we have cameras placed on all four corners as well as we have uh, cameras inside the second floor of the building in the upper left there. So when you have cameras inside of the building, you can actually see through the walls because we actually placed the video uh, with 3D models. So now we can actually see through the walls where we have, uh, uh, we have cameras inside the building. So some interesting capabilities take place. You can see what's happening. The red cylinders are people, the blue cylinders are cars. But we can also go into the, the building where we have cameras so from a remote, and this could be anywhere in the world. You can go in there. Here we have uh, two of our interns walking around. You'll see the kind of dark room milky on the right. Uh, that, that's another wall. If you look to the far right, you'll see some people behind the wall. Anywhere there's cameras gives you the ability to kind of see behind those walls. So it's a, this, you got the powers for remote observation are, are, are spectacular. Um, and that's, that can only happen because you have it in a model. So also these, these problems of occlusion where you can't see behind something. We have a camera there in the model, we can see through that wall or through that container on a rig or through those things so that accidents don't happen. Um, next thing I'll show you is actually, uh, this is uh, Capital Factory. So um, this is down in Austin, Texas. Uh, we created, the, took the BIM file from their architecture drawings and just very quickly created a, a model of their building. Um, so you can see it here. Uh, it's the 16th floor of the Capitol Factory. Um, to show you the model real quick, yeah, with the fifth and the 16th floor we have, we have about uh, 16 cameras in there. Um, so when you click on the model, you can actually see the picture in picture. There's a view of what's uh, being viewed in the model. Uh, there's the kitchen area. Uh, and then uh, there's the uh, elevator deck right there. Um, and so, uh, we play a video here. Now this is, this would be a seven second delay. I obviously don't want to go live for this because you know in the capital factor right now. But uh, in a seven second delay, we actually can replay inside the model what's happening in real life. So if you think about it, there's some very interesting capabilities here. If I, uh, we, uh, I'll let it go here. Um, this is the ele elevator bank. And so you can see people kind of coming in and out. Uh, and the delay is just very, very minimal. Um, but uh, it gives you the ability to actually place people in space and time. When you look at that video in a, in a, in a CRT screen, you can't tell where someone is really. So um, here, you could actually start to create zones inside of a building or on a rig, where if I created a zone here and said, uh, I only need people here that are wearing a white hat, you know, uh, the AI can look for that and understand if a person 
is wearing a white hat during that zone. You know, so you can have AIs kind of become these uh, eyes and ears for you and create uh, safety bots, if you will, and you can create security bots. You know, so you can have bots looking for events and things that happen inside the model and alert you when those things when those things are happening. Um, so the last thing I'll show you, just kind of an interesting demo here, um, is uh, something I'm running out of time. Is this just real quickly? The, these are glasses of water. The blue glasses uh, are full, and the yellow glass is empty. We taught an AI to understand the state of this object: which glass is full, which glass is empty. You know. So in this case, uh, again, the, the blue, the blue ones are uh, full, the yellow is empty. So we have uh, one of our guys come in and pick up one of the blue glasses uh, and start to uh, take some water out of it. So they take some water out of it, put the glass back down. Now the AI realizes that that glass is now more empty than full. Uh, then we can take the full glass on the left and pour it into the glass on the right. And now the AI has learned that that glass is full at this point right now. So the reason I showed you that is that there's some very interesting things you can do with AI that a lot of people don't think about. That's virtual sensors. If I have a, a bank of, of uh, 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 gauges, I can actually point at an AI, a camera at those gauges and teach it. If this gauge is this way, this one's that way, it's bad alert somebody, you know, things like that. So I can teach an AI to understand the state of objects. Uh, this truck is full, this truck is empty. You know, uh, we can teach AI to understand the state of objects. Um, so uh, summary, just, uh, you know, I think it's, there's never been a better time for the energy industry to embrace AI-based automation, uh, whether it's remote observation or improving safety or radically optimizing operations. Uh, the pieces are in place now for an age of abundance in energy. Um, you know, at this point, I'll just, uh, in there, um, a couple minutes over, uh, but uh, turn it over for questions.